It's that time of year again. Kids Camp is coming. June 3rd, 4th, and 5th from 6 to 8 p.m., we will be having our Searching Safari themed Kids Camp. We need everyone to volunteer this year. Anything from games, snacks, crafts, Bible story leaders, we need you. You can sign up to volunteer or register your kids for Kids Camp online or in the foyer. We are so excited for Kids Camp and we cannot wait. We hope that you are excited and ready to sign up to join us. Searching Safari is a one-of-a-kind experience for Amarillo this year, and we want you to be there.
It's that time of year again. Kids Camp is coming. June 3rd, 4th, and 5th from 6 to 8 p.m. We will be having our searching safari themed Kids Camp. We need everyone to volunteer this year. Anything from games, snacks, crafts, Bible story leaders, we need you. You can sign up to volunteer or register your kids for Kids Camp online or in the foyer. We are so excited for Kids Camp and we cannot wait. We hope that you are excited and ready to sign up to join us. Searching Safari is a one-of-a-kind experience for Amarillo this year, and we want you to be there. Well, good morning. Welcome to River Fellowship. Go ahead and stand. So a couple of days uh, before Easter, I uh, woke up and I didn't have a voice. And um, I started getting mad because I love praise and worship. I love, I just love to sing, but I couldn't sing. I had no voice, literally. And uh, so Easter morning comes along and I still don't have a voice and I'm not able to sing and I'm having a really serious conversation with the Father about what is going on. Why can't I praise you? And uh, the Holy Spirit told me, I never asked for your voice. All I want is your praise, and you can praise me without your voice. And so this morning, I want you to think about that. It's not about your singing. It's not about where your hands are. It's not about what we're doing. It's just about praising the Father. So as we roll into this and sing praise the father salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption. 
passion and one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Fiction by his blood, I have been refreed. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is death's defeat. All praise to God the Father, and all praise to Christ the Son, and all praise to the Holy Spirit. And I
trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. Yes, we trust the name of Jesus. Suddenly articulate 
with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified and were the whole earth echoing his imminent name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Come on, let's lift this up. Sinmost melody and every human heart its native cry. Well, then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Yes, be lifted high. And oh, Christ be magnified. Stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too And I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life and if I join you in your sufferings, well then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, so my heart will still be singing, my soul will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let His praise arise. Christ be Let's sing that together again. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. The altar of my life. Magnified, we let his praise arise. 
So Christ be magnified in me. And oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Father, be magnified. Jesus, be magnified today. Less of us and more of you. Everything for your kingdom, your will, your power. God, we give it to you. And be lifted high upon our throne of praise. Your kingdom is forever. God, we sang that the nations, they rise, they fall but your kingdom is forever. So all glory, honor, power to you in your kingdom. God, we pray for our planet, for, for your peace to overwhelm all. God, we wanna pray over the nation of Israel and God in the complicated conflict that's arisen over there. God, we pray power over defense of Israel. And we pray on behalf of innocent lives that you will save there. You are our protector. God, we thank you that you are a protector and you are powerful over all of it, over every piece. God, we thank you for that. Open our hearts, open our ears to hear what you have to say today, Jesus. We thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you this morning. It's good to be able to worship together. Uh, We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. While you're finding the passage, let me just welcome those of you that may be visiting with us. Uh, This morning, we're so blessed that you've joined us here this morning. We would love to be able to connect with you this week. Once we're dismissed a little bit later, as you leave, we invite you to stop by the Guest Connect desk and just fill out a Guest Connect card, drop it in that black box, and gives us the opportunity to see if we can minister to you some way uh, during this week. Also, in the foyer, we have a a sign-up desk for Kids Camp, which happens in June, but we're doing two things. One, we're signing up children and we're signing up volunteers So at that desk, there's a QR code that you can do two things. One, you can sign up your child for Kids Camp, but you can also scan that code and sign up as a volunteer. If you would like to volunteer, we had a good group sign up for volunteer last week. If you'd like to volunteer, there's also a sign-up sheet. If you're not in the QR QR code, you can just fill out the sheet, and uh, Alyssa will get in contact with you. And then third, men. I just want to remind you, big event coming up. It's almost here. It's this Saturday, Men's Night at High Plains Retreat Center. 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, as I've said many times, we're going to throw stuff and eat stuff and shoot stuff. It's going to be a great time of just hanging out as as men, having a good time, but even more importantly than that, to be encouraged by one another, to encourage one another, to have a good time to worship together. So I hope you'll make plans to attend. If you have somebody you want to bring with you, feel free to bring them with you. Even if you're a first-time guest uh, and a man, we'd love for you to come and join us. Saturday, 5 o'clock, High Plains Retreat Center. Uh, you can find out the address on our website if you need to Google that address. All right, let's look at Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, And provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the, the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, 
and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. Now, this passage has uh, several applications, several interpretations attached to it. One of them is just an historical account. It's an historical account about the role of Isaiah in the life of the Israelites. So it depicts the state of Israel and then how God uses Isaiah to speak to the children of Israel as a prophet. So Isaiah here describes part of what his calling from God entails. And so one, that this chapter deals specifically, historically, with Isaiah and the life of the Israelites. But secondly, there's, it's also a prophetic word. This other application is a prophetic word about the coming of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ will do in us and for us and through us, through his work on the cross. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, Jesus is in the synagogue and he stands up, he's teaching, and so he pulls out the scroll and he turns to the passage we just read, Isaiah 61. He reads verses 1 and 2, he folds it up and he sits down, and in my head there's like this big dramatic pause while Jesus is just sitting there, and finally Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What he's saying is, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. So what we just read is a prophetic word that Jesus fulfilled in his coming and his salvation work. But this morning, I don't want to deal with either one of those applications. I want to deal with something different, a different application that I'm simply going to call the work of the Spirit of God in our life. I think here in Isaiah 61, it's an Old Testament picture of a New Testament reality a new testament application when we come to christ it starts here with verse one that caught my attention when it says the spirit of the sovereign lord is on me some insight about the work of the spirit of god now in the first application obviously obviously the spirit of god was on isaiah and on the people of israel as they began to rebuild the spirit of god obviously was on jesus christ and in jesus christ in a very trinitarian way that we're not going to talk about today but he was anointed with the holy spirit as he did all that he did but we also know that when we are in christ the new testament picture is that when you come into christ the holy spirit lives in us as well when jesus was preaching to the disciples or he actually was preparing the disciples for his death and his ascension he tells the disciples that he is going to send to them His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit will live within them. We know from 1 Corinthians that as believers, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Romans, we are told as believers that the Spirit lives in us. In 1 Corinthians, we know that at salvation, we are given a deposit, and that deposit is a it guarantees our inheritance, and that deposit is the Holy Spirit of God. So what we see here is that through the death of Jesus... We are reborn and redeemed and regenerated at that point of salvation. Now the Spirit of God begins to do His work of sanctification within us, conforming us into the the image of Jesus Christ. So this, this Isaiah passage, I think, gives us a really good New Testament application and look as to the role of the Holy Spirit. So that's why I want to go down this morning. So this I want to look at seven or eight works of the Spirit of God to see if the Spirit can speak to us and minister to us this morning. So here's the first work. We see it in verse 1. The first work of the Spirit is what I will call His retaining work. Work of retaining. That word retaining means to hold in place. It might be like a retaining wall that holds all the soil in place. We get it from verse 1. It says, He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, the brokenhearted are those whose inner person has been crushed. It represents those that mentally or emotionally, psychologically, spiritually have become broken and devastated and shattered. This word bind up, it has two different word pictures to it. One definition means to to wrap up, to tie up, if you will, to kind of hold things together. I don't know if you've ever had this application, but 
it, maybe you've been in a situation where you have a bunch of cables, cords just all over the place. They're just a mess. They're spread out everywhere. Maybe you have a home and entertainment center. You have all the, the technology stuff. You have all these cables. Uh, maybe at your computer desk with the monitor and the printer and all that stuff, you have all these cables. Uh, I know a lot of times here on the stage, if you see other maybe performances somewhere, th at times there can just be cables everywhere. So what do you do? You get some ties and you just tie those cables to where now they're all neat, they're all in place, they all hold together. That's the word picture here about bind. What it's talking about is when you feel like your life is falling apart, when you feel like you are falling apart, when you feel like your life is a, is a mess, the Holy Spirit will come and in essence wrap his loving arms around you and he will begin to bind you up and wrap you up and hold you together so you don't fall apart. The second word picture, though, means to bandage. And this is like maybe you've got this happen to you or one of your children. You get maybe a, a severe cut, a big gash somewhere in your body and it just rip, rips open. So you have this huge open gash. What do you do? You go to the, the emergency room, you get it maybe butterfly stitch or you get it stitched something what are they doing they're closing that they're binding that why so that healing can take place so that wound can be healed that's the other word picture about binding the brokenhearted those times when you feel like life has just shattered you and you're broken up it's it's he'll he'll act as a bandage and he will begin to bring healing into your heart and into your spirit this is this retaining work of the spirit also in verse 1, though, we see a second work of the Spirit. It's what I'll call his releasing work. Verse 1 continues and says, He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Back in this day, often the, the prisons might be down in a dungeon, might even be cut out in a big cave somehow, but it would be dark. It would be in darkness. Sometimes they would even be chained up in their prison. Also in that day, there would be prisoners of war. If a city went against another city or a people group wanted to attack another people group, they were victorious. They might bring some of these people back as slaves, and they would be slaves, and they would be taken captive. They would have no freedom. They would do only what their captors would let them do. So oftentimes, they would, look, would work long, hard hours, but they would not get to reap the benefit or the reward of their work. It would all go to the slave masters. This is the, the word picture here, that there are times in our life when we can begin, uh, uh, we can become enslaved. We've, we've, we've lost this sense of, of freedom. And so the Spirit of God will come and He will release us, just like He releases a prisoner. He will release us so we experience that freedom in Christ. I'm sure you remember the story of Lazarus. If you remember the story, Lazarus is, is dead in the tomb for four days before Jesus gets on the scene. So when he gets in front of the tomb, you know he has the stone moved and he calls out Lazarus and tells Lazarus to come out. So sure enough, Lazarus comes out, but when he comes out, he's still wrapped up in all of his grave clothes, which really probably would have looked a lot like a mummy, just completely bound. And so he's still bound up. He's alive but he's still bound up in his grave clothes. So the next thing Jesus says, he's looked at the people there and he says, take off his grave clothes. He's alive, but he's still running around <laughs> in grave clothes. So set him free, take off the grave clothes. The reality is that sometimes we may be set free in Christ, but we're still running around in bondage. We're still wearing prison clothes. We're still wearing grave clothes. And Isaiah is saying here that there's a releasing spirit that the Spirit of God, a, a releasing work that the Spirit of God does in our life. Galatians 5 1 says, It is for freedom that we've been set free. He set us free for a big reason that we would experience freedom in Christ. 2 Corinthians 3 17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Jesus, in his redemptive work, sets us free from the penalty of sin. But the Spirit in His sanctifying work, He is seeking to set us free the, from the dominating power of sin. Jesus has set us free from the guilt of sin, but now the Spirit wants to set us free from wearing the shame of our sin. So this is the word picture. And maybe this morning you're in Christ, but you're still wearing your grave clothes. The Spirit wants to release you 
so you can truly walk in the freedom that he sets you free to enjoy. When we get to verse 3, we see a third work of the Spirit. And I'm calling it a replacing work. Verse 3 says, He has sent me to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. This word bestow means to place. The word instead that we read means to replace. So what it's saying is what has been placed in your life, the Spirit of God wants to replace with something different. And he gives us three word pictures here. And really, it's, it's really saying basically the same thing, just a little bit differently. He will replace ashes with beauty. The idea of beauty is a crown. So my translation says a crown of beauty. So instead of pouring yourself with ashes, which is something you would do if you're in mourning, he's going to crown you with this sense of beauty. Instead of you being in mourning, he's going to give you the spirit of gladness. Instead of being in despair, he's going to replace that with this spirit of praise. This word despair, it's attached uh, in in the Hebrew to a lamp that's about to go out. The light's about to go out in the lamp. That's what despair is like. The light is about to go out. He's going to replace that with this spirit of rejoicing and praise. So really, all three of these are telling us in this work that God's going to replace this defeated spirit with the spirit of victory. So in your life, when you feel like you're hopeless, he will replace that with hope. When you feel lifeless, he will replace that with life. When you feel defeated, he replaces that with victory. When you feel powerless, he replaces that with power. Now, in verse 4, we see three other works of the Spirit. And let me give you a little context and backdrop and background for these next three. In verse 4, the works of the Spirit are contained in this backdrop of Israel sinning against God. They've rebelled against God. We looked last week a little bit that Israel had this tendency at times not to submit to the Lord, not to submit to God. Instead, they walked in stubbornness and sinfulness and selfishness. And so this is the word picture here. In fact, Isaiah chapter 1 calls Israel a sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt. So because of this tendency to be stubborn and selfish and sinful, they experience at times the discipline of God. And during that discipline of God, they at times were overtaken by the enemy. They were taken captive by the enemy. They suffered at the hand of their enemy. Sometimes their cities were destroyed. Sometimes their land was devastated. So it's in that context and that backdrop that we see these works of the Spirit in verse 4. The idea of the New Testament application is this. The Spirit of God can do a tremendous work in your life even when you have sinned, even when you have failed, even when you have fallen, even when you have made bad decisions, even when you have made bad choices. In the midst of your spiritual failure, even if you've chosen at times to walk in stubbornness, to walk in sinfulness, to walk in selfishness. If you'll return to the Lord, the Spirit of God will do this three-phase great work in your life. He will rebuild you and restore you and renew you. And this is what verse 4 tells us. So we see this fourth work of the Spirit. It's a rebuilding work. It says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. Rebuild simply means to build back. To make it better, to reestablish, to make it firm. At our house, we have some soft building blocks. They're not Legos. Okay, they're they're softer than Legos. They don't connect like Legos. They're they're builder than they're they're bigger than than Legos. But they're just kind of like soft blocks that you can build stuff with. And over the years, our grandkids have really enjoyed building things with those blocks. So sometimes they'll be building stuff and they'll build it really high and they enjoy building it and all of a sudden they get a a little look in their eye and they just knock it over. Well, after they knock it over, they'll build it back up again. And then they'll knock it over again. And when you watch them, I think they get a lot more joy out of knocking it over than they do building it up. But sometimes while our older grands would be building something, the younger grands would come, come in and they get that look in their eye 
and they come and they just demolish what the elders have built. That doesn't go over quite as well. So there'll be a little bit of, you know, confrontation going on with the grandkids. But then the, the elders, they'll start building again. And here comes the little grand. They're going to knock it over again. So when I, when I see that happening, at times, I'll just go back there in the room. And so I first tell the young grand, you can't do that. You can't knock over what they're building. So I'll sit there, though, so as the older grands begin to rebuild, and you see that look in the young grand's eye again, about to, no, you can't, you can't do that. And so I sit there, and I protect them so they can keep building. And because it's been knocked all over and scattered over the room while I'm also keeping them from attacking that structure, I'm also kind of throwing them the pieces. Say, here's this piece, here's this piece. So I'm helping them kind of rebuild. This is the word picture right here of rebuilding the ancient ruins the idea is this the spirit of god is a master at stepping in and empowering you to rebuild that which has been torn torn down in your life whether that tearing down was self-induced or that tearing down was was an external attack from the enemy he will help you rebuild what has been ruined Similarly, he says also that he will restore. He adds to that a restoring act. Verse 4, he, a restoring work. Verse 4 says they will restore the places long devastated. To restore, it has a kind of a two, two ideas. It means to get up or to raise up. So Israel, literally, it would be he's going to help raise up Israel again and, and, and help him reestablish and restore what's been torn down but for us in Christ it means that the spirit will help us get up <laughs> when we've been knocked down in life the spirit will help restore us and help us get up here's the truth some of you may have fallen spiritually so hard so often so far that you feel like you're too far gone but here's the truth here's the good news you can't fall too hard you can't fall too often. You can't fall too far that God cannot raise you up and restore you. You may have been in a bad place spiritually for a long time. But you need to know and hear this morning that the Spirit is strong enough, loving enough, and determined enough to lift you up and to raise you up and to stand you up and to restore you into a place of victory. That's the Spirit's restoring work. Similarly, there's another one, 6 and verse 4. It's a renewing work. He continues and says, They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. This word renew, it's, it means to make new, to make like new, to repair so it looks new, that it is new. But the phrase that caught my attention here was this phrase, devastated for generations generational devastation some people turn that generational curse the idea is that maybe something you're going through an issue that you're struggling with an issue that has become a stronghold in your life and in your heart you're not the first one in your family to struggle with that it was in your parents and their parents or their parents and their parents it's like this generation after generation after generation there's been something that has just been gripping that family line through the generations there's a stronghold that has gripped what this is saying now is he can he can take that and he can renew all of that he can break that bondage he can break that stronghold just because family members in the past have struggled with x doesn't mean you have to but the spirit of god can take that which has created generational devastation and make it new repair it and rebuild it so the good news about verse 4 is that the spirit of god he will empower you to rebuild restore and renew that which the enemy has torn down taken away and trampled on now you remember if you remember before i did these three i set the context in the background that it's in the context of being in sin when we make that decision to live in stubbornness sinfulness selfishness that sometimes we reap this what we sow but here's the here's the truth every one of us have been in that state at one time or another every one of us 
has lived from time to time in sinfulness and stubbornness and selfishness. We've all fallen. We've all sinned. Now, some may have done it longer. Some may have experienced more devastation as a result of it. But we've all experienced it. But here's the truth I want you to hear this morning. There's nothing in your life so destroyed that God cannot rebuild it. There's nothing in your life so broken that God cannot restore it. And there's nothing in your life so ruined that God cannot renew it through the work of His Spirit. Brings me to the seventh work. The work that I've called renaming. The renaming work. Verse 3 says, They will be called oaks of righteousness. Verse 6 says, You will be called priests of the Lord, and you will be named ministers of our God. This renaming process is a re-identification, if you will. Actually, it's, it's depicting this new nature and this new purpose that you've been giving. It re-identifies you in relationship to this new purpose and this new nature. Just as God changed Saul to Paul and Jacob to Israel, it's a renaming, a re-identification. And this is part of what the Spirit wants to remind us of, that we have a new name. As Revelation 2.17 says, God will give us a new name. We have been re-identified. And so here he says, one, you're called an oak of righteousness. What that means is you have a new nature. You now are holy and blameless before the Lord, not because of anything you've done, but because of what God has done through the death of and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the work of God. But you'll be this oak of righteousness, so you have the power to live holy. You have the power to resist temptation. You have the ability to stand strong in the midst of trials and storms and temptations and tribulations. also says, though, that you'll be called a priest. You'll be named a minister. That's reminding us of our new purpose. Once we are in Christ, we have a different purpose purpose and now our purpose is to glorify the father it's to serve the master it's to do the will of our father it's to bring people into fellowship with God that's the ultimate purpose of our life when you look at the new testament you see now in Christ we are called a child of the king we are a royal priesthood a holy nation we are blameless before the Father. We are more than conquerors. We are more than an overcomer. So this has given us this indication and this, this, this visualization, if you will, that we have been made new in Christ. We have a new name. We have a new identification. So what that means is in Christ, you are no longer identified by your sin. You're identified by your Savior. You're no longer known for your past. You're now connected to a glorious future. Which brings me to the, the last work of the Spirit. And it's the work of rejoicing. Verse 7 says, Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. When we allow the Spirit of God to do and be all that He wants to do and be in us, we will live with this spirit of rejoicing. When you realize what the Lord has done for you, when you realize what Christ has done for you, when you realize what awaits you with this glorious inheritance and this glorious future, this spirit of rejoicing will penetrate and flood your heart and your spirit. And there's a great word here. In Christ, there is no disgrace. There's just grace. In Christ, there's no disgrace. There's just grace. Take the dis out of there. We no longer walk in disgrace. We walk in grace. So this morning, may you let the Spirit of God do His work in you. His work of retaining, releasing, replacing, rebuilding, restoring, renewing. But really the question for you to consider this morning is do you need the Spirit? to do a work in your heart today? If so, what is that work? Do you need Him to restore you? Do you need Him to renew you? Do you need Him to rebuild some things that have fallen apart? Do you need Him to bind your broken heart? My prayer is that you would remember this morning it's all about grace. 
And God will take whatever has been devastated in your life, make it new, give you the spirit of rejoicing. So may the Spirit do His work this morning. Would you bow with me? As is our custom, we have prayer team partners available in the front and the back. I'm available as well. If you feel like the Spirit of God is speaking to you, is ministering to you, and you would like to pray with someone about whatever's going on, it may be relative to this message, it may not. But if you would like to be prayed over, prayed for, prayed with, we would love to do that. But I invite you to allow the Spirit of God just to minister to you. Whatever part of this message may speak to you, I pray that you would give the Spirit the opportunity to minister. Father, we just thank you for your Spirit in us. We thank you for the powerful, ongoing, unending work of the Spirit of God. And so, Father, I just pray in these moments that we would allow you, your Spirit, to do and say and speak whatever needs to be done and said in each of our hearts and lives this morning. Would we be responsive? May we be receptive. May you do your work in us. In Jesus' name, amen.
You're the shepherd of my soul And all I am And all I have Holy Spirit, lead me on Holy Spirit, lead me on Search the world, but he couldn't feel man's empty praise, treasures of fate are never enough. So you came along, put me back together. Is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, tell them there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, nothing is better than you.
Man, what a great message, amen. I'm telling you right now, as I was listening to it, I'm a perfect example of you who can never stray too far. God is a God who wants to rebuild by the Holy Spirit, amen. No, amen. There we go. All right, so men, just want one announcement. Uh, I know it's been announced a lot, but men, you really don't want to miss Saturday. Make it a point to be there. So I already got five at the High Plains Campground. I hope to see you there. Other than that, um, go and be the church. Have a good week. Thank you.